The internet loves the German World War II big cats, such as the panther, tiger, or even puma. I can tell you that much from experience. However, it wasn't these vehicles that scared the world and helped Germany conquer almost all of Europe. These feats were accomplished using a far more humble set of vehicles, such as the Panzer II, III, IV, Stug III, or the subject of today's video, the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 200 Einundzwanzig. However, if you want to learn more about all these other vehicles, make sure to subscribe and also check out our website. There are a ton of amazing articles on there. And if you want to give us a boost, do consider donating on Patreon or PayPal, or here on YouTube. Every bit counts. Following defeat in World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, the German army was forbidden from developing armored cars, although the police were allowed to have a number of them. In the late 20s and early 30s, even before Hitler's seizure of power, the German Reichswehr started the development of a new armored car which would culminate in the rather unimpressive Kraftfahrzeug Dreizehn, basically a standard civilian car with an armored body plunked on top. People as they were, they nonetheless saw service up to the invasion of the USSR in 1941, but it was clear long before that that something better was needed. This led to a 1934 program to create a unified four-wheeled chassis that would serve as the basis for a number of German military vehicles, called the Standard Chassis 1. Among the main requirements were good mobility, off-road capabilities, good suspension, a rear engine, four-wheeled steering, and ease and cheapness of production probably as a result of large-scale production. The 221 was based on the chassis and was meant as a light machine gun armed reconnaissance armored vehicle. According to the German doctrine, the reconnaissance armored vehicle's primary goal was to race ahead of the main force. They were to scout for an army's strong and weak points. Once the enemy positions were observed and vital information was gathered, the armored cars were to report back. Armor and weapons were mainly for self-defense, and engagements with the enemy were to be avoided wherever possible. Thanks to the Hawk V8 engine giving out 75 horsepower, the 4-ton 221 could reach a maximum speed, on a good road, of 80 kilometers per hour, and had a range of at most 350 kilometers on a full tank of 110 liters. On top of the standard chassis one was a distinctive armored body with a pitiful 8mm of armor on the front and 5mm on the sides, although decently angled. While this meant that the vehicle was mostly bulletproof, it could be penetrated by rifle caliber shells at shorter ranges. However, this was a conscious trade-off made to improve mobility and lower cost, especially given that the vehicle was not meant to get into a prolonged close quarter combat with the enemy. The frontal armor was increased to a more respectable 14.5 mm in 1939. The initial armament was a single 7.92 mm MG-13, which, in typical German pre-war fashion and despite its name, was introduced into service in 1930, not 1913. It had an ammunition load of 1,000 to 200 rounds placed in belts. If needed, the machine gun could be raised along with the gunner's seat in order to allow for high elevation for anti-aircraft work. With a maximum elevation of 70 degrees and a maximum depression of minus 30. This arm would later be replaced, in most cases, by more modern drum-fed MG-34s. The armament complement also included a submachine gun, six grenades, and a signal pistol. The machine gun was protected by a seven-sided pseudo-turret which did not sit on a ball race, but was directly connected to the machine gun mount. It was very light, with an armor thickness of just 8mm at 10 degrees, and also featured four vision slots in the sides to allow the commander to observe his surroundings even in a high-threat environment. The crew could access the vehicle through the two large hatches in the lower part of the hull, as well as through the open top of the turret. This open top was protected by two hinged wire meshes, as was the hull top behind the turret. The role of the wire mesh was to prevent enemy thrown grenades from getting inside the vehicle while saving on weight. The crew consisted of just two men, a driver in the front of the vehicle, and a commander gunner in the center. However, the 221 did not have a radio, and so communication with other vehicles or troops had to be carried out with flags or verbally. For long-range communications, specialized vehicles inside the unit had to be used. The 221 entered production in 1935, with 341 being built in all until 1940, split into three series and manufactured by at least four different companies. 
Despite the original intention for the vehicle to be cheap, it was rather expensive and difficult to build. The 221s were used to equip reconnaissance detachments of various units, including Panzer, Motorized, and Regular Infantry Divisions. However, these armored cars were rather rare and could often not be provided in the numbers needed. As an example, an infantry division in 1939 had around three armored cars, either the 221 or the 222. Only the Panzer divisions and their tank reconnaissance battalions were heavily in need of armored cars, fielding 90 in total. With each reconnaissance battalion, two armored car companies existed. Each armored car company had a signal detachment, Company HQ, one heavy platoon, a company maintenance section, and two light platoons. One light platoon consisted of four SDKFZ-221 and two SDKFZ-222, and the other of six of the 221s. These numbers, of course, varied in time, with the unit and availability. In 1942, the Sonderkraft Fahrzeug 221 was removed from all lists and organizations in the Panzer and Motorized Infantry Divisions. However, like the Panzer I, it continued to see service as a replacement and spare vehicle. The first use of the 221 in German hands in a foreign land was during the Anschluss of Austria in 1938, and during the German occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1939. As part of Aufklärungsabteilung I, Several 221s participated during the occupation of Memel in 1939. Their first combat experience in German hands would be gained during the invasion of Poland. At least 290 221s took part in the invasion. Although they did not encounter many tanks, the Polish anti-tank guns proved to be more than a match. While achieving victory, the German army lost a large number of vehicles, especially light-armored ones. The 221 also saw service during the invasion of Denmark and Norway as part of Tank Battalion 40 for special purposes. In May 1940, around 280 SDKFZ 221s took part in the invasion of France. Due to much better coordination, the reconnaissance units worked better with the tank regiments and Air Force, and were able to beat back Allied forces. Furthermore, the knowledge and intelligence that the fast and mobile 221 and the reconnaissance units in general collected were essential for the German application of the doctrine of mobile warfare. It is unknown if any 221s were sent to North Africa, as no photos show them there. During Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, approximately 210 221s were still in service. The Soviet Union would be the end for the 221, as the harsh climate and mud season were too much. Furthermore, the large numbers of Soviet AT rifles, guns, and tanks contributed to the decreasing number of vehicles that were still operational. This and the discontinued production led to the removal of the 221 from all organizational tables, and it was replaced by the 222 in 1942. Nonetheless, it continued to see service as a replacement and reserve vehicle. Furthermore, 221 versions with the 2.8cm anti-tank gun or an anti-tank rifle were introduced, both of which continued to see service until the Battle of Kursk. Many of the improvised radio vehicles and command vehicles served within the divisions until the war's end. Due to the 221 being available in relatively large numbers and its obsolescence, Many vehicles were converted and reused in new roles. The armament of only one machine gun proved to be insufficient, so in 1941, the first attempts were made to increase its firepower. Besides the machine gun, an opening for a 7.92mm anti-tank rifle was added. This anti-tank rifle was introduced in 1940, but, due to its obsolescence, few such modifications were made. From 1942 onwards, most 221s were to be rearmed with the 2.8cm heavy anti-tank rifle. While classified as an anti-tank rifle, it more correctly fitted the role of a light anti-tank gun. Surprisingly, no traverse or elevation mechanisms were used. Instead, the gun operator had to aim the gun using a spade grip offset to the right from the breech block. An unusual element of this weapon was the use of a tapering bore. Basically, the barrel section that connected to the sliding breech block had a diameter of 2.8 centimeters. Towards the end of the barrel, at the muzzle brake, this diameter was reduced to 2 centimeters. 
The front part of the 221 turret was cut, and the gun mount was placed on top of the armored body slightly in front of the turret. The gun's trailer was meant to be carried with the vehicle. In order to protect the operator, the original two-part gun shield was retained. The MG-34 was retained inside the vehicle, but its ammunition load was decreased to 800 rounds. During the war, the German army suffered a severe lack of command and radio vehicles. Therefore, many replacements or old vehicles had to be reused for this purpose. Due to a shortage of radio vehicles such as the 223, an unknown number of 221s were converted into radio vehicles. Since these were mostly field conversions, the vehicles differed greatly from each other. Some had the turret removed, whilst some still mounted it. However, all vehicles were outfitted with some kind of antenna. An unknown number, presumably a single vehicle, of 221s were converted into self-propelled anti-aircraft guns. The vehicle had its turret replaced with a mounting with two anti-aircraft MG-34s and a protective shield. In 1935, the Chinese Kuomintang was feeling more and more threatened by the Empire of Japan on its borders. As a result, German advisors in nationalist China advised the purchase of German tanks. Alongside Panzer ones, ammunition, firearms, and trucks, 18 Sonderkraftfahrzeug 221s were also acquired. On arrival, they were organized into the 3rd Tank Battalion stationed in Nanjing, where they would later see service. However, the vehicles were not used in their intended role as reconnaissance vehicles. During the defense of Shanghai in 1937, they were mostly used as mobile pillboxes. Although defeated during the defense of Shanghai, the vehicles survived until at least 1944, according to photographic evidence. The 221 turned out to be a success during the early war, the vehicle featured many new technologies, such as four-wheel drive or the rear-fitted engine. For the first time, it introduced standardized production to the German army. However, like many other armored fighting vehicles developed and built during the interwar years, the vehicle was obsolete after 1940. The sole machine gun could not provide adequate firepower against any armored vehicles, and the armor could barely protect against small arms fire. However, Due to its mobility, it was fairly popular amongst the troops, who would use it as a command station or radio vehicle during the Middle and Late War. So, what do you think of the 221? Was it a good compromise, or was it a bad vehicle that survived way past its expiration date? Let us know in the comments. If you want to learn even more about the vehicle, you can check out the full article over on our website, or join our Discord to chat with the author and the rest of the team. Link in the description. Until next time, keep us in your sights.